Okay, wonderful. Oh, the joys of coronavirus lockdown church. Good grief. Pastor becomes tech, tech um, assistant, and it's, it's just not my bag, to be honest. But um, I'm sure there's a reward waiting for me in heaven. That's what I read in my Bible, anyway. Pastors who excel in Facebook Live and all of the rest of that jiggery pokery should be given another crown, is what I heard. I'm joking, tongue in cheek. Tongue in cheek. Um, wonderful. Okay. Uh, if you want to get your Bibles out, we're going to be continuing today with our study in 1 John. So we're going to be in 1 John, John? 1 John <laughs> chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Give you a chance to get your Bibles out and thumb across to the right page. If you're watching via um, the church website, I'm so sorry about all the connection problems. Um, really difficult at the moment because we're nomadic and we don't have any Wi-Fi. So that was uh, me trying my best to run the service through my 3G, which is just not working. So um, please pray that one day the Lord will give us a space with Wi-Fi. Amen. Fast broadband. Oh, Lord Jesus, that will be the day. Praise God. But I hope the rest of you um, who are here are enjoying service so far. I just wanted to thank Mike and Dave for leading us so well in worship. Um, and also, hopefully you're warm. It is quite toasty. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling that today. It's nice. So we've been studying through the book of First John. We've been in First John for about 14 weeks now, there or thereabouts. A long time. And it's just been such an interesting study. I don't know about you, but going through a book of the Bible, verse by verse, allows you to take time to ponder things that maybe otherwise you would just gloss over, right? There are things that we've touched on in our study of First John that maybe aren't always things that we like to discuss or like to talk about. When I when I mean that, I'm talking about things like false teachers, you know, and stuff like that. But this is what the text throws up for us, and so this is what we have to talk about. And that is the power, brothers and sisters, of expository preaching. That's why we practice this in this church, so that you don't get Pastor Graham's pet doctrines or Pastor Graham's pet subjects, because that would be the temptation for me, because I'm human, and we all have our favourite verses, our favourite passages, our favourite books of the Bible. But each and every verse of the Bible is divinely inspired. It is theanosas, breathed out by God, as Hebrews 4 says. And so therefore, we want to give every verse the same attention as another verse. Whether it be a genealogy in the early chapters of Matthew or Luke, or whether it be John 3.16, each verse deserves our undivided attention. So let's read from chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Most of the translations that you'll have will be pretty much unified on the translation itself. There are no big surprises unless you're reading from a more, uh, more of a paraphrased translation. But most of your translations, your NIVs, ESVs, NASBs, whatever else you might be reading, even the NLT, um, will be unified on this. So it reads like this. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it is not yet being revealed what we will be. We know that when he is revealed, we will be like him. Because we will see him just as he is. And all those having this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. That's the rendering straight from, from the Greek, but you should all have something akin to that in your Bibles. Unless you're reading a heretical translation like the Passion or a paraphrase like the Message. Please, if you bring a Passion translation, to this church, 
you will be excommunicated. <laughs> Thank you. Just get out of the way. Um, so, <laughs> uh, yeah. If you bring one of them, don't come back. All right? Or leave it and we'll burn it on a pyre. There you go. Since we've begun studying 1 John, um, we followed the Apostle John. We followed him as he's unpacked for us what it looks like to truly be a Christian. And he's been drawing a contrast between the hallmarks of a true Christian and that of a false Christian. Now, I don't know whether that's something you've ever really thought of before. This idea of true believers and false believers. It wasn't really something I had thought of um, up until a few years back when I was preparing to teach uh, a passage or preparing to teach a sermon on John 4. Now, if you know the Gospel of John written by the same author, there's a passage in that, in chapter 4, where we find Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman at the well. Do you know the, the passage? <clears throat> He's speaking to this Samaritan woman and he ends up saying to her, um, true worshippers, the true worshippers will worship my father in what? In spirit and in truth. And I remember reading that passage and what struck me was that phrase, true worshippers. And what is the logical uh, What's the logical conclusion that we must draw if the Apostle John tells us there are true worshippers? Well, it, it is that there are also false worshippers. False worshippers. And actually, when Jesus is saying this, it's kind of a bit of an uppercut. It's a low blow towards the Samaritans who believed that they truly did worship God. But if you know anything about the Samaritans, these were people who had begun to withdraw from worship at the temple in Jerusalem. And now they were worshipping on the high places. And they only had a few of the books of the Old Testament. They only took a few of them, not all of them, not the full revelation of God. And so Jesus is almost having a little bit of a dig. And he's saying, the true worshippers will worship my Father in spirit and in truth. That means with all of themselves with all of their heart, but also according to truth, according to what the Bible says about God. So what's the point? What's the big deal? Why draw this, this uh, point out? Well, I'd like to remind you all that although we live in an age with smartphones and cars and things that the people who wrote your Bible did not have, by and large, things haven't changed all that much in the world. Every human born in this world is still born into sin. There is still a devil. There is still an enemy, an adversary of our souls that works to try and pull us away from God. These things have not changed. The errors that we fall into believing about who we are and who God is, they haven't changed. In fact, the more that you read of your Bible, the more you realise how similar the times we live in are to those times in which Jesus lived. And so there are false believers today, just the same as there were false believers then. And what would a false believer look like? Well, John has spent some time unpacking this for us. It would be somebody who has a false belief about who Jesus is. That's it at the very core. This is somebody who believes they worship God Oh yes, I love God. I, I have faith in God. I believe in God. Well, guess what? Belief in God will not get you to heaven. The devil believes in God. Did, you, did that ever occur to you? That Satan believes in God. That the demons know Jesus. In fact, there are demons who are more doctrinally correct than many people who profess themselves to be Christians. Did that ever occur to you? It's possible to have a pretty well-formed theology about Jesus and still be a false believer. It's crazy, because we're called to worship both in spirit and in truth. So we've got to have the truth, but equally we have to worship him in spirit. There are theologians who know the truth. They could unpack for you the great doctrines of scripture, but their heart is cold towards the Jesus that those scriptures present. And then on the other hand, there are people who are very passionate 
about God and passionate about talking about the Bible, but don't care about doctrine. And this is the scourge of the Western church. This is what I believe is one of the biggest problems in the Western charismatic church right now, is you'll have people over here that say, oh, I passionately love Jesus, but I don't care about theology. Oh, I love Jesus, Pastor, but don't bore me with your doctrine. Problem is, as soon as you ask the next question, well, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Who is this Jesus that you love? In order to answer that question, guess what that person has to engage in? Theology. Theology. You cannot define Jesus without theology. You can't tell me who Jesus is without doctrine. And so therefore, every Christian, every person who professes to be a Christian, whether true or false, is doing theology. The question isn't whether they're doing it. The question is, are they doing it well? Is it good theology? You don't have to be uh, a, a huge intellect to be a good theologian. You just have to trust your Bible. You have to love the Word of God. You have to enjoy reading it. And as Charles Spurgeon said, if there are parts of the Bible that you find yourself running from, you, you see it in your daily reading and you think, okay, okay I'll just rush through this one. Uh, this one makes me feel uncomfortable. Those are the passages that you've got to read constantly over and over again until you do get them, until you do love them, until they do speak to you. So just as there were then, today also there are true and false believers. And John has been trying to show us how to pick apart the two. You see, he wrote this letter as a pastor. What's a pastor? What does it mean to be a pastor? Anyone know? Shepherd. He's a shepherd, yes. That's it. It's not all about multitasking, funnily enough, yes. Most of the pastors back then didn't have to try and operate a live stream. Oh, Lord Jesus, that you chose me for that particular punishment for my sins. But pastor means a shepherd, okay? It's some, and what's a shepherd? When we think about a shepherd, a biblical shepherd, what, what sorts of things are we thinking about? They had sheep, right? So they had sheep. And what did they do with those sheep? Fed them. Yeah, they looked after them. They fed them. They led them into pasture. So they made sure those sheep had the right stuff to eat. You know? If they got into a bad patch of grass or dirt, they moved them on until they found fresh pasture so that they could eat the right stuff. So part of it is looking after them and making sure the flock gets the right diet. But also, what else does a shepherd do? Particularly when we think of David, who was a shepherd. What did David do as a shepherd? He fought stuff. He fought stuff. He fought animals. I don't know who said fight bears. All sorts of stuff like that. He fought lions. He fought bears. He protected the sheep. So that's the other role of a pastor. And that's what we see John engaged in right here. When we read this letter, the first word of the passage today is what? Beloved. You might have... Something slightly different, dear, dear friend, maybe. But the Greek word is agapetoi, which if you know, have you ever heard that old um, phrase, that, the one that says, you know, that, that agape love, right? You heard about agape love? That's where agapetoi comes from. It means beloved ones. So he's operating as a pastor. He cares for these people that he's writing to. They are not just numbers to him. They're not just bums on seats. These are beloved individuals who he cares for. So he's doing pastoring. He's caring for the flock. You see, this is one thing that it's important to recognize is that the Bible categorizes as sheep. The Bible calls you and I sheep. That's not very flattering. Sheep are stupid. I don't know if you ever noticed that, right? Sheep are dumb. I mean, I've been chased by sheep. I don't know how dumb that makes me. But um, I've been chased by a fearsome group of sheep before. Um, but they're not the most clever 
animals. They get trapped, and they get lost, they don't always know what's best for them. And so in that sense, I think it's a really good depiction of how we are. We get lost, don't we? We get confused, we run down dark alleys, we need rescuing. So we are the sheep. But what the Bible also says is that though we may be sheep, though we may get it wrong, though we may not be the best at picking our way through life, we are valuable. We are valuable because we have a value in the eyes of our shepherd. That's what makes you and I valuable, that God says we're valuable, right? And that's a beautiful thing. So as sheep, we are both in need of a shepherd, but we are also valuable. And the good shepherd will not let one of his sheep come into danger. And this is what John's doing right now. He shows a real love for the flock. He doesn't write to them in a way they can't understand as well. Um, this, this writing is quite simple. It's quite upfront and straightforward, isn't it? We, we set that right at the start of our, past, uh, sorry, of our series on this book. Is that it's very direct and he doesn't want anything that he's saying to fly over the heads of the people that he's writing to. And number three, the work of a Christian pastor, which is demonstrated to us here by John, is that he's doing what? He's constantly calling them back to Jesus. He's calling them back. He's saying, remain in Jesus. Don't go running off after so-called clever new revelations, clever new teachings that might sound awesome and so smart and they might promise us so much, but ultimately they're the doctrines of demons. You know, He calls them back to the word that they had at first, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I think this is so powerful today. I think that we're living in a time right now when the gospel is a message that's largely been forgotten. It's largely been forgotten. At least it is suppressed, if not entirely ignored, in many churches. The reason I say that, and it might sound shocking to say it, but... In order to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, there are certain things you have to mention. Otherwise, it ain't no gospel of Jesus Christ. Number one, if you preach a gospel, but you don't mention sin, guess what? That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. You cannot have the gospel without sin. Unfortunately, lots of pastors are trying to preach a gospel that doesn't have sin. Sin. You try to preach a gospel without sin, where's the need for the cross? What does the cross become? If Jesus isn't coming to redeem a sinful group of people for himself, if he's not paying for sins on the cross, like 1 Corinthians 13 says, then what is he doing? And that's where you begin to get all kinds of strange and wonderful teachings about what the cross is. I encourage you, just for fun, just go read the shack. You see how twisted the message of the cross gets in that book. I don't need to punish sin. Sin is enough of a punishment on its own. Is it? Is it? Well, somebody ought to have told God the Father that before he sent his son as a ransom for many. Somebody ought to have told the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John who preached that he, on his death, in the, on the cross rather, was making propitiation. He was offering himself for your sins. Maybe W.M. Paul Young, the author of The Shack, ought to have told God that. It's a bit awkward, really. You can't preach a gospel without sin. You can't preach a gospel without Repentance. How many times do you hear this? You see, I think most people believe that when we talk about sin, we're talking about those things you do, right? When I talk about sin, I'm talking specifically about the bad stuff I do, about the mistakes I make, when I miss the mark, when I do something I shouldn't do, right? And yes, yeah, that's sin. But when the Bible talks about the sin of humanity, it isn't just talking about those things. If you read Romans 5, right, what is Paul going on about? 
He's talking about the sin that you have because you're just a human. Because you were born into Adam. The Bible says that sin isn't just the stuff you do. Sin is what you are. Sin is your identity before you're in Christ Jesus. Now unless you preach that, where's the need for the cross? If sin is just the stuff you do, and you're not an inherently sinful person, then isn't it possible that somebody could live without sin? If they got the right education, if they had the right spiritual diet, if they had the right temperament, would it therefore not be possible that they could live without sin and not need the cross? You know, Donald Trump said recently, about about a year ago actually, you know what, I just try not to sin. You know, if I don't sin, I've got nothing to repent for. The problem with that view is that by definition, in the fact that you are a human being, you are a sinner. You can't help but sin. You love sin. That's a difficult passage to preach, isn't it? Why do you sin? Because you love it. If sin wasn't enjoyable, you wouldn't do it. Why do you like sin? Because you were born in it. You live in what Paul calls a body of sin. And yes, now as a Christian, having been forgiven of that sin, having had your sins paid for, having had the law which was over you, demanding payment for all of your sins, having had that crucified in Christ Jesus. Yes, now, glory to God, you're a new creation. And the body of sin is being done away with. But listen, without the preaching of the sinfulness of humanity, where's the need for the cross? There's no such thing as a Christian gospel without sin. There's no such thing as a Christian gospel without repentance. And there's no such thing as a Christian gospel without a Jesus who is both fully man and fully God. Fully man in that he stood in your place. And fully God in the sense that only God, only an infinite being could pay or could take upon himself the infinite wrath of God. Now there's another thing that you do not hear preached on very much these days is that God is wrathful. It's not very comfortable to talk about, is it? But if you read the first chapter of Romans, verse 16 to 18, for the what of God is being revealed. The wrath of God, present tense, is being revealed against all what? Ungodliness And unrighteousness of who? Of man. For they did what? They suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. See, Paul knew nothing of the neutrality of man. Paul knew nothing of the honest atheist just trying to figure out what's true and what's not. Paul didn't believe in atheists. He believed that humans, when they have the truth, guess what they do without Jesus? Without Christ and without grace, they take that truth and they stuff it deep down inside their pockets so that it can't preach to them. Without Jesus, without the cross, without grace, all of you are going to hell. And that's the gospel. That's the gospel. Without Jesus, without the cross, guess how much hope you've got? Zero. Nothing you can do can earn a way or a path to eternity. Nothing. The gospel is your only hope. The cross is your only hope. I'm starting to sound like Leia from Star Wars, so I'm going to move on. (laughs) If you're not a Star Wars fan, you'll have missed that, but don't worry. So, <laughs> our big themes in these, in these verses today, and when we look at these verses, there's a couple of words that get repeated, and that's how we know what's important to the writer here. Number one, first word that gets repeated over and over again is this word, um, phanerot, okay, which means to be revealed or to be, um, to appear, okay? 
So there's a sense of Jesus' second coming, right? He wants us to think about when Jesus is coming back, okay? So that's the first thing. That word gets mentioned a couple times. And Jesus' return, I might add, is something that John believes that we should really have in the forefront of our minds. Uh, he, he thinks we should think about this a lot. And in fact, when I looked through yesterday and tried my best to count how many passages there were in the New Testament about the second coming, there was a lot. I lost count or I lost interest, one or the other. But um, there are over 50 passages about Jesus' return. That's a lot. And in fact, one person worked out that if you do it on average, uh, every 25th verse in the New Testament has something to do with Jesus' second coming. That's crazy. It's a lot. And in fact, no one talked about it more than Jesus himself. A whole bunch Jesus talks about when he's coming back. And then there's another verb that's talked, sorry, that's mentioned twice in these two verses. And that's the verb, we are. We are. Don't often think of that as a verb, but it's about identity. So John's talking about identity. He's talking about what we are now as Christians, and he's talking about what we will be in the future. So in a sense, we're talking about something that hasn't happened yet, but is is going to come, which is Jesus' return. And we're talking about what we will be. So our eyes are being lifted up out of the present, where we're occupied with all of our busyness and all of our things, and we're being made to stay on the horizon. To look on the horizon where where things haven't quite yet developed and things haven't quite yet come into full view. That's where our eyes are being placed. Now as a Christian, how often do you do that? How often do you take your eyes out of what's happening now and lift them up to the horizon and look at things that haven't happened yet? How often do you think about heaven? How often do you think about what new body you're going to receive when Jesus comes back? These are the things that John wants for these believers and for you and I to think about. But before we get to the future, let's start in the present. The late Francis Schaeffer was a dude and he had a beard which was awesome. He had one of those cool beards that had no moustache on it, just a big old like that, like an Amish beard. Anyway, he was a theologian and an apologist And that doesn't mean he apologised for Christianity, but he defended it. And he said this about Christians. He said, by definition, a Christian is a person of a book. Christians, all together, are a people of the book. We're a people of the Bible. And that is to say that someone who is a Christian is somebody whose worldview and whose self-conception are shaped by the Bible. That means that a Christian is, in essence, we're a slave to the Bible, to the Word of God, in that the way we view the world is filtered through the Scriptures. We're not free to just kind of have a go at reimagining things. Uh, We are a people of the book. And we are whatever the Bible says we are. That definition isn't subject to change. Just as the Bible says, God isn't subject to change. James 1.17, in him there's no what? There's no shadow of turning. I love that. And what John says in this passage here is that now, the Bible says to us, now you're a child of God. Beloved, now we are children of God. We are children of God. And if we skip back to the verse that Pete preached so well uh, last week, It says this, it says that see what kind of love that the Father has bestowed on us, that we may be called children of God. So we are children of God now because of what? Why are we children of God now? If we go back to verse 1, what clue do we get? What caused that relationship to come about? The love, right, exactly. The love that was bestowed on us. Keep up with me, I know it's warm in here. But it was the love of God bestowed on us that made us children of God. It was something to do with him, not something to do with us. Isn't that cool? Right, it's always good to look at causes in your Bible. It's always good to look at what made things happen. And we are children of God because of what? Because of the love that was bestowed on us. What love? What love was bestowed on us? What does that mean? Well, again, I think we have to remember that the author of this book, 1 John, 
also wrote the Gospel of John. And who knows what the most famous verse is in that Gospel? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that all who believe in him might not perish but have eternal life. So guess what? The most famous book, sorry, the most famous verse in the whole Bible, written by the same author, is telling us what that love is. For God so loved the world. Now listen, this is also not only the most famous verse in the Bible, but it's also tragically the most misunderstood verse in the whole Bible. Because most people read it like this. For God so loved the world, he couldn't get enough of the world, so he gave his only son. Isn't that right? He so loved the world. Oh, the the great reckless love of God. And that's not wrong. It's true, right? But that's not what it says in the original language. In the original language, it says this. For God, in this manner, loved the world. In this manner. So this passage isn't first talking about the magnitude of, of God's love, but it's talking about the manner in which God loved us. For God, in this manner, loved the world, that he gave his only son. So what is the love that was bestowed on us? Jesus. Jesus is the love that was bestowed on us, that makes us children of God. That's incredible, isn't it? Did you ever know that about John 3.16? So it's not wrong to say that God's love is extravagant. It's just Wrong to say that God had this kind of nebulous, weird, unattached love for the world. That he just, he couldn't do anything but give his son. That would be the wrong way to interpret John 3.16. What it's actually saying is, listen, Nicodemus, listen. God has loved the world in this way. By sending Jesus. Don't go looking for the love of God outside of Christ. You won't find it. Guess what you'll find outside of Christ? The wrath of God, that's what you'll find. The love of God is manifest in Jesus and Jesus only. Don't get me wrong. God's grace is manifest to all. It reigns on the righteous and the unrighteous, doesn't it? All right? Everybody, even the most wicked of sinners, even Adolf Hitler, got to enjoy some of the grace of God, didn't he? He drew breath. Whose, whose air was that that he breathed? It was God's. Who gave the water for him to drink? The Lord. Who allowed Hitler to live on this planet, wake up and see the sights he did? Who allowed him to enjoy relationships with other people, however horrific they may have been? God. In his own providence, God allowed Hitler certain graces. And that's what theologians call common grace. But you want to know where the love of God is? In Jesus. That's what John 3.16 is saying. So John's talking about this specific love that was bestowed on us. Jesus. Right? Jesus Christ, his adopting love. Right? The, the adopting love of God is different from any other kind of love. It's not sentimental. It looks like something. And a child of God is somebody who loves Jesus. Is somebody who has come into relationship with Jesus. Somebody who's taken the cross personally. That's the love of God that makes you a child of God. You can... You can actually be a very committed churchgoer and not be a child of God. You can be a Christian minister and not be a child of God. Because what's being said here in the passage is that it is the love of God through Jesus given to you and I. It's our Taking of that love and being in that love, which makes us children of his. It's not the job that we do. It's not our habits. It's not our predispositions. It's him that makes you a child of God. In fact, John 1, the first chapter, you remember this passage here. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become what? To become children of God. Who were born not of blood. That means you don't get to be a child of God because you were born through the right parents, as Nicodemus thought would be the case. Nor of the will of the flesh. There isn't anything that you can do to make yourself a child of God. Does that ever strike you? 
Maybe you were in here thinking your testimony was quite bland because you weren't a heroin addict. But guess what? Every single one of you was a child of the devil. Every single one of you was a son or a daughter of disobedience and had no hope but for the grace of God. Did you ever think of that? Every single Christian testimony is miraculous. Because you cannot be a child of God through the flesh, nor of your own will, but of God. Secondly, this is what this passage is saying, is that the Christian is somebody who has a personal relationship with God. Now we are children of God. You're a child of God. You're not simply a subject. You're not a citizen in his kingdom, but you're a son, you're a daughter. Jesus said in John 14, and I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, who the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be with you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. And in Romans 8, we've got this passage, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Did you hear that? Heirs. Not just children, but heirs. There is an inheritance that belongs to you as a child of God. A Christian is somebody who can legitimately call God their father. Their father can call God dad, in a sense. Though I prefer father. You can come to him, even with the most trivial of issues, the smallest of things in your life. You can bring it to him. Why? Because he's your father. Isn't that good news? Like my girls bring me all kinds of trivial requests on a minute by minute basis. <laughs> Don't you, babe? Yeah, you love it. And they are not scared to do it. They're emboldened. Why? Because I'm their dad. And I fix stuff for them when I can. Are you feeling awkward now? Yeah, sorry, I'll stop talking about you. <laughs> That's what fathers do, okay? They are intimately bothered about their kids, about what's going on in their lives. And if God is your father, that means there's nothing too small for him. There's nothing too small in your life. There's nothing he doesn't care about. Nothing too trivial. There isn't a standard that you have to meet in your prayer life. I know there's a great J.C. Ra quote that I shared a few weeks ago. It was like, don't worry if your prayers are mumbled, half-formed, and ill-spoken. God doesn't care. He's your father. Jesus understands your prayers just fine. You're his child, and there's nothing too trivial in your life for him. Secondly, this, and this is the place where I want to finish up today is that now we are children of God. But he goes on to say this, it is not yet being revealed what we, what, what we will be. What we will be. That means that a Christian is somebody whose identity is being unveiled piece by piece in an economy of time. It has not yet been revealed what we will be, but we know that when he comes, we shall be like him, for we shall what? We shall see him as he is, right? A Christian is somebody who is waiting for their full identity to be revealed. When will that happen? When Jesus returns, when this historic event happens. This is an event that will happen in time and space. You have your identity as a child of God. That's now. You have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The same one that Jesus had. And that's now. You have the love of the Father. And that relationship with him. That's now. And you have the purpose which is given to you by the Great Commission in Matthew 28. When Jesus said, go therefore, preach the gospel to the nations. Making disciples of every nation. 
However, get this. The stuff that's now has become all that we think about. That's become what we think about. But in the early church, guess what? They had a far greater focus on what was not yet. They had a bigger focus on the things on the horizon that they couldn't quite see than you and I do. But guess what? They were way more fruitful than you and I. Do you ever think there might be a connection there? I think today we've become obsessed with productivity, haven't we? We've become obsessed with being productive. What's the newest way to make your church grow, right? What's the best way to make sure you can fill your church on a Sunday? What's the best way to reach the lost? How many programs do you have running in your church right now to ensure that you are the most effective church, not wasting any energy, the most economic church in the kingdom of God? It's all about the now. It's all about what you can do. How many times this week have you thought about that moment in time when you see Jesus coming on the clouds? Let me read some stuff to you that's going to blow your mind. And there will be signs in the sun, the moon and the stars. And on the earth, distress of nations and perplexity. Because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. People fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up. Raise your heads. Because your redemption is drawing near. In Matthew 24, 27. For as lightning comes from east and shines as far as the west. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. When Jesus comes back, he's not coming back as a baby. He's not coming back as a meek and mild carpenter. He's coming back as the Lord of glory. And he will be with his heavenly host. He's coming back like lightning. And every eye will see him. Listen to what Jesus says. This is to you and I. Because that moment in history is going to be scary. When that day comes, I don't know if we'll be alive for it, but that's going to be intense. Right? We have reason to have hope and to not be afraid of that day. But for many, it's going to be scary. But this is what Jesus says to his own. Let not your hearts be troubled. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me also. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I not have told you that I go, to a, I go there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Jesus has gone ahead, and right now he's preparing a place for you. He's preparing a place for you to dwell. Can you imagine what that would be like? You know, in Philippians, Paul says this, but our citizenship where we dwell is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. When Jesus comes back and come back, he will. All those who are his, all those who have faith in him, all those who have repented of their sins, who have come to him, recognizing they've got no hope outside of Jesus Christ. All those who have recognized their own bankruptcy and need of him, they will be the ones who have cause to be hopeful in that day. It's the broken that will have cause to be hopeful in that day. Are you broken? Do you know your need of Jesus? I'll tell you what now, I've been a Christian most of my adult life. All of my adult life, in fact. But I've never known my need of Jesus more than now. I've never known my own brokenness, my own frailty, my own failures more than now. How about you? Do you know your need of Jesus today? Then you have cause to be excited about his coming. 
when you'll receive a new body. Let me tell you this, Christians, this new body that you're going to get, guess what it's going to be like? There's a prototype in the Bible. Jesus' new resurrection body. That's the prototype. You're going to get one of those babies. Think about that. Right? I'm getting older. I'm beginning to realize how cool that is. Because my knees crack every time I bend them. My back hurts almost constantly. Right? Your new body is going to be incorruptible. Your new body's not going to get sick. It's not going to age. It won't know pain. It won't know disability. All those in wheelchairs who are believers, who were broken in sin, knowing they need Jesus, guess what? They're not going to need a wheelchair in eternity. They're not going to need that wheelchair. There'll be no more suffering, no more medication. Your new body's going to be immortal. It's not going to age. You're not going to get crow's feet. (laughs) Something I think about regularly. (laughs) Not. It's cool, isn't it? Where are you going to live? Have you thought about that? You ever read Revelation 21 about the New Jerusalem? Let me give you a picture before I finish. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates. And at the gates, 12 angels. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of Israel were inscribed. And on the east three gates, and on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The wall was built with jasper, while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, agate. Don't know how to say that. The fourth, emerald. The fifth, onyx. The sixth, carnelian. The seventh, chrysolite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, topaz. The tenth, chrysoprase. The eleventh, jacinth. The twelfth, amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each of the gates made with a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. There are some who figured that this city, by John's measurements, was 1,400 miles in length on each side. That's big. It's a big city. That's where you're going to live. That's where you're going to be and spend eternity with Jesus. There's no sun. We don't need sun in the new city because guess what? God's glory is the sun in this new city. This is stuff that just boggles the mind. And I just want to encourage you. I want to get those juices flowing for each of us as Christians. Because John seemed to think that as we have this hope in the future, as we look forward to the future of what's going to come with Christ, he said those who have this hope in him do what? They purify themselves, just as he is pure. I never connected those two things. I never thought of that. But every single one of us, we all have a battle in purity, don't we? We're all wanting to be more pure. We're on that journey together. But did you ever connect looking forward to the return of Christ as something that could practically help you in your walk in purity? I didn't, but that's what John says. He doesn't say all who have this hope in Christ might purify themselves or should purify themselves. This is a statement of fact. All those who have this hope, what is this hope? It's all of the stuff we've talked about today that we get in Jesus Christ. It's that hope. It's the looking forward to hope to the horizon. All who have this purify themselves. This is cool. As Christians, as we grow in purity, we will do so as we fix our eyes on the horizon. As we look ahead, as we get excited about the day of Jesus' return. As we take a moment every day to pull our head out of the practical details of life, the things which keep you busy. Take a moment each day to meditate on the return of Jesus, to get excited 
about the things to come. And in so doing, church will become more pure. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. And Lord God, I pray that this most heavenly message, this most awesome message about the future is going to be fuel on the fire of our Christian life. You know, there's the old saying that says, don't be too heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good. We all know what that means, but the Bible teaches us to be heavenly minded. Lord, I pray you'd make us as a church way more heavenly minded than we are right now. Way more excited about the things that are to come. And Lord, help us in your mercy to grow as children of yours. To know how to relate to you as our Father. Not to be afraid to bring even the smallest prayer request to you. And Lord, my prayer is also that we'd learn to walk in your love. Not living for your love, but living from your love. As children of God now. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And may the Lord, sorry, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and nevermore. Amen. 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 Well, thank you guys. God bless you. And um, we have midweek Tuesday, so. Uh, Please do join in with that. If you need any more details about how to log in or whatever, all the technical stuff, um, you can drop that either in an email to me, graham at hopecitychurch.uk.com or in the WhatsApp group, however you please. But we'd love to see you Tuesday for midweek. God bless you all and keep safe.